Hi. Yes. I, um, guess it can, I guess it can speak up now. Yes. Sorry. So if they want to hear the session, they must log in. Can you On the online session. Hello. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to this closing um, plenary. And if you want to be able to hear the proceedings, you log in onto the online session. So please log in onto the online session. Does she know that no one, that people are still coming in? And we should be up here? Oh, <laughs> there's no one here. To... What? I'm not in charge. Um, so, um, you look so much as in charge. <laughs> <laughs> Don't run away. I'm not going to run away. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So good morning and welcome to the closing plenary of the 30th annual IAPI conference. Now the COVID-19 pandemic wrought havoc on people through its health impacts, lives have been lost, and there is evidence of long-term effects of the disease. The policy responses to the pandemic also brought in their wake hardship as jobs and livelihoods were lost due to the restrictions imposed and care burdens and vulnerability to violence of women and girls increased. There was also evidence of an increase in, in anxiety and depression. So the pandemic, the policy responses and their effects clearly showed that the economic and the social cannot and should not be considered as separate and independent. The COVID-19 pandemic has been seen by many feminists as an opportunity to bring about change. There is a need for change in the conduct and content of economic and social policy. For example, in a statement to the special envoys that the African Union had mandated to mobilize support to address the COVID-19 pandemic in Africa, African feminists said the following, COVID-19, and I quote, COVID-19 needs to be a turnaround point from orthodox laissez-faire models and overly financialized states. This crisis is an opportunity to dislodge structural inequality and reframe the political economy which contributed to this tipping point. End of quote. And this is the African feminist post-COVID-19 economic recovery statement. So in addition, as have several feminists across the different continents, the African feminists in this statement made recommendations for change. So there have been many recommendations for change, but we must ask, to what extent have recommendations by feminist economists been adopted by policymakers? How should feminist economists take advantage of this moment to be part of the process of program and policy design? And what are the challenges to moving beyond rhetoric to reality 
in the implementation of feminist strategies that may be included in policy documents? And how can these challenges be surmounted? So we have this with us this morning four speakers who will speak to these issues. They've got wide ranging experience um, in addressing issues um, such as this. I shall introduce them in turn as they make their presentation. And so I would first like to call upon Crystal Simeone. Crystal Simeone is a Pan-African feminist activist working on macro level economic issues. She currently serves as the director of NAWI AfriFem Macroeconomics Collective, the NAWI Collective. In her role as director, Crystal curates the work of the collective towards contributing to building a feminist community in Africa of individuals and organizations working on influencing, analyzing, deconstructing, and reconstructing macroeconomic policies and narratives. The collective also works on reimagining alternatives through an intersectional Pan-African feminist lens. Before this, she was head of advocacy with a focus on economic justice at Feminet and was the policy lead of the Tax and International Financial Architecture at TJNA before that. She is currently an Atlantic Fellow for Social and Economic Equity at the London School of Economics. And before um, um, Crystal um, takes the podium, I would like to um, mention a quote that she has. And I quote, as we navigate through this global pandemic, we cannot talk of building back better. What was built was never for us, only from us. What we must do is build back differently. This is the moment to completely reimagine what the world could be through feminist lenses, more just, more equitable, and more inclusive. So Crystal, if I may um, invite you to make your presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Abena. I hope you can hear me. Not if you can't breathe, thanks. Um, thank you for such a gracious um, introduction and for stalking me a little bit and finding one of my quotes that was a little surprising. Um, in prepping for this session with Abena, she was clear that we want to focus a little bit beyond what the feminist plan is and into a discussion around how we get it done and how, like she says, we move from rhetoric to reality. And so I prepped my notes and got on a plane and came to Geneva. And at the opening plenary, Radhika asked what the economy is for. And so began my rearranging and canceling of sections of my notes as I listened in at different sessions and had really great conversations over coffee and meals. So a little like Rebecca Grinspan did in her session, I put my notes away and really decided to focus on three things that have come up for me in this week sort of trying to keep in line with Abena and what she asked me to speak on, but also with a slight caveat that I'm not known for following rules, so I'm sorry, Abena. I've been thinking of three buckets of thoughts this week. The first, the power of narratives, and then reformist versus revolutionary work, and lastly, the magic of dreaming. And so my first bu bucket of thought is around the power of words and narratives. How do we understand concepts, narratives, and words but also who is using them and to what end. There's been a lot of conversation about how language and words get co-opted. And a really loud example that has resonated through this week has been on empowerment. And it's one of those words that has been really co-opted. And suddenly when the World Bank uses it, it it's really reduced and morphed into a word that we no longer understand, we no longer recognize, and we no longer see ourselves in. And we know that words can be powerful. Yesterday, I listened to Melissa Mahoney talk about the thaumaturgic power of language. It's a new word for me. Thaumaturgy means something like the power to conjure up or to evoke as if by magic. Language, she says, can have thaumaturgic power in the sense that naming things brings them into existence for us by calling our attention towards them. Language can also have an almost magical power to get things done by directing our energies in certain ways, like towards what we can do or don't value, 
what we research and advocate for, what we teach, and the policy ag agendas we help to develop and promote and influence. And I'm also constantly questioning how do we hold the line and continue to defend true meaning of these words. But really also, I've been thinking a lot about who defines even these narratives that these words sit in, and in what context are they rooted in, whose realities and whose worldviews are emanating from them. I come from a pan-African feminist space, and it is also very clear to us that the who in terms of narrative creation, as progressive or as well-intentioned as they may be, may not always be ours, may not always reflect our realities nor our stories. At Nawi, we have a knowledge portal which curates in themes African women's thought leadership on macro-level economics. The portal is the brainchild of Fatima Kelleher, who I believe is in this room, and is curated by Elizabeth Miner, who's been archiving the portal. The portal makes a stand in that entries into this growing portal must be written by African women. And I worked in tax justice in a former life and always thinking there's such a growing body of knowledge on tax by feminists. But when we look at our portal, we only have 71 entries under tax, compared with 197 entries under women's labor, for example. It is obviously still an ongoing curation, but it's already showing us where the gaps in analysis by African voices are, and a story of justice is not complete until all our voices have space. I know there's been a lot of critique and analysis of the current economic system, and there seems to be an evolving feminist plan, but who is doing the analysis and on what contextual nuance, histories, and realities is it based on? Whose voices get to define the problem and thus shape the discourse is what I'm really asking. This in turn has an impact on what alternatives we're coming up with as a result. The question of who is a crucial part, part of this battle. And even then, what is considered knowledge and analysis can be problematic, qualitative versus quantitative. And where in this room is there room for oral streams of wisdom and knowledge? Bumika this morning <coughs> talked about epistemological violence and quoting Amadou Mater Bao as an example on African um, oral tradition, he says, the collective memory of peoples had served as both the formal and informal tool of passing down the history of Africa for several generations. But this has been rejected as worthless because of the preconceptions that the lack of written sources and documents made it impossible to engage in any scientific reconstruction and study of the lives of African peoples and societies. There was always, there was also the consistent refusal even to see Africans as the creators of original cultures which flowered and survived over the centuries in patterns of their own making. And so we know the critique of neoliberalism is, is apolitical and ahistorical, but our response to it, our fight against it, cannot be carried by the same norms. Our response must be complicated by class, by ethnicities, by race, and by region. The second bucket of thought is around the tension between a reformist and a revolutionary idea and agenda. I personally would like to burn down many of these institutions and I can constantly carry matches in my bag. As I engage in all these spaces, As I engage in all these spaces, I wonder if we're fighting for women to be included in an already broken system and question if this is really freedom. Gita Sen this week echoes the same, same when she says, we do not want an equal share of a poisoned pie. At the same time, I understand the work of moving the agenda within. I have seen fearless feminist advocates lose battles, but my goodness, I have seen them weave magic and move agendas. But even here, we have to be careful about who is occupying advocacy space. And this morning, Sarah Iqbal from Hewlett spoke about the need to ensure feminist voices from national levels are able to speak up and influence in these spaces of power, all the while doing it in a way that isn't instrumentalist. Even when these spaces are so violent, and quoting Agazeta Bate, every time you enter their room, you're at the end of a barrel of a gun, begging for your life every time you come out wounded. But here I am, sitting and standing on freedoms I may not even consider freedoms, because there have been women before me who have been fearlessly fighting in these policy spaces from Beijing to beyond. 
I think a lot about whether we're fighting a revolutionary battle or a reformist one, and I wonder if we can have both. Can both truths, both strategies exist at the same time? Is there space to push for reform and fight in the trenches of the holes of power for decision making, while at the same time being fully cognizant that we must be fighting for a liberation that is carried by complete overhaul of the systems, of the processes, and of the institutions that we know. It's complex, but we have always done complex things. What is so clear is whether a reformist agenda or a, or a revolutionary agenda, both must happen in collective, with others building solidarity. In this collective action, we must center this idea that Lino Somme put so eloquently in the opening plenary of moving between the realms of concrete to abstraction and back to concrete. We must not lose sight of the fact that we must always land back on the feet of concrete. And here I will quote Amilcar Cabral. Always bear in mind that the people are not fighting for ideas, for the things in anyone's head. They're fighting to win material benefits, to live better, and in peace, to see their lives go forward, to guarantee the future of their children. And my final bucket of thinking, and what I hold closest to me, is the politics of dreaming and imagining. What I think in part is what Emilia Reyes refers to as calling for pushing the boundaries. Our emancipation will be carried by our dreams, and we sometimes, I know I do, get so lost in the shackles of what is, what this world that we exist in. We sometimes forget that everything is a construct. We not only can, but must deconstruct it and reconstruct it, knowing, as I said in my last point, that can be done both in revolutionary, but also in reformist ways. But our dreams must be so clear, so tangible, that we have a solid idea of what we're fighting for and towards. For many of us in different parts of the world, this concept of dreaming has been robbed from us and in its place has been replaced with what I call the industrialization of the space. Encumbered by proposals and reports and the need to justify ourselves in words and narratives we think we need to be heard by, but also that has proved to be needed to make sure the resources come in so we can keep the doors open. But also the dreaming is what keeps so much of us going, constantly fighting from our respective spaces it is part of the work that Naui does in existing between the spaces of concrete to abstraction and back to concrete. And I leave you with this example. Early last year, Wangari Kinoti and Fatima Kelleher, both Naui associates, wrote a really compelling policy piece that's published in the Feminist Africa on an African feminist take on macroeconomic system change as we navigate through this pandemic. Alongside that, Two Naui associates, Agazeta Bate and Abila Abdumalik, wrote a creative imagining based on that piece. And I leave you with a little snippet of it and a reminder to dream a little bit. In, an, in a time not so far away, a time perhaps parallel to the one we are in now, a new way is coming into being. The next time you blink, stay there. Keep your eyes closed for just a few more seconds and you will see it the future coming into being, the future now. In this place, care is a story also told in numbers. When the people create their budgets, they ask questions like how can numbers look like liberation? How can percentages be kind? So many stories can be told in how a country spends its money. There are so many stories of broken hope and unfulfilled dreams, of tra tragedy and what ifs. The perceived heroes become villains, the real ones becoming martyrs, the ideas and the hope becoming notes in history. Even the temporary sparks of light were once in a generation miracles, bright, shiny, sometimes solitary things. But this is a time that envisions everyday miracles like grass that grows through concrete or rain on a summer day or rivers of hot stream or honey from bees. The people want the vision to be as mundane as breathing for the spectacular to be the norm. So they work in solidarity to be one among many. GDP is no longer a thing. Here, they measure happiness, wellness, leisure, love, safety, shelter, education, freedom, beauty. They measure the health of the people, the soil, the waters, and the air. They measure life. All of these are signs of wealth, indicators of an economy of abundance for all the people. Here, all the gains are shared and all the people are cared for. 
Here, it is clear that there is enough for the living to live. In this place, the harvest must always be mutual. Thank you. Thank you very much, Crystal. Um, I would now like to um, invite our second um, speaker. And before I do that, I will um, give some information about him. So our second um, panelist is Paul Ladd. And Paul Ladd has been director of the UNRISD since October 2015. Before taking up this position, he had been at UNDP where he had most recently been director of the team supporting consultations and technical inputs for the 2030 development agenda. Previously, he led UNDP's policy team on inclusive globalization, including trade, development finance, and migration. From 2008 to 2009, he provided support to the office of the UN Secretary General on the financial and economic crisis and engagement with the G20. Paul is a member of the International Geneva Committee of the Swiss Network for International Studies, SNIS, and the UNITAR 2030 Advisory Council. Paul is also an international Geneva gender champion. He has committed to ensuring that relevant gender concerns feature in every piece of published unrest research and to seek gender balance in the Institute's network of collaborating researchers. ANRIS supports the International Geneva Gender Champions Initiative Panel Parity Pledge. So may I invite Paul um, to make his presentation. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, 30 seconds on UNRIS uh, first. <laughs> so um, UNRIS, the UN Research Institute for Social Development, is, a, is an autonomous uh, research institute based within the UN system. Um, that focuses on the social dimensions of contemporary um, development issues. And uh, our autonomy is our strength because it allows us to ask the really hard questions uh, around uh, politics and power and distribution. And when we do our job well, we try to act as a bridge for academic and thinking communities around the world to access the UN and policymaking processes um, there. Our research strategy is focused on reducing inequalities and helping shifting power towards a new ecological and social contract. And our four research programs uh, focus on transformative social policy, gender justice and development, alternative economies for transformation, and environmental and climate uh, justice. Now, I had uh, five uh, points that I wanted to cover and they're going to be, uh, I guess, a little bit more, more practical. Um, and I apologize for that. I've always worked at the interface of policy and research, but I've never really uh, been uh, an, an academic or a researcher. Um, and the first point I'd want to make is that when we, as UNRIS, did our own analysis at the start of the COVID pandemic on the uh, impacts around the world on different communities, of the pandemic itself, but particularly of the uh, restrictions and constraints and policies that governments put in place to deal with the pandemic. We talked with our network and did a big network survey about what those impacts were, and they clearly reinforce the gendered impacts of both the pandemic and uh, the responses to it. So we found uh, you know, incredibly deep and scarring impacts on women's employment, women's income, the situation that women faced at home in terms of domestic abuse and violence, and also how the restrictions limited uh, mobility, freedoms, how the, there were additional uh, drawdowns on women's time at home because of closed schools. So that's, that's the first thing I wanted to say. And the, the second point, I think, is, you know, it comes up all the time and it's very central, but I did want to reinforce and recommit how much UNRIST has worked in the past and how much we do work on care. UNRIST has worked on care for, I think, 25 years from a research perspective, including the contributions of Shara Razavi and Valeria Esquivel and now with Francisco Cosmontial. And at the moment, uh, we're focused very much on helping Mexico design and cost and plan 
and think through the politics of implementing a national uh, care system. It's a very important piece of work for us, and we're doing that with the Levi Institute. I mean, the second thing that we're doing is that we're supporting the, the Global Alliance for Care on the work that they're doing politically to promote the agenda of care in international fora and to get political support for it so more countries realize, A, how important it is, but B, how possible it is and how beneficial it will be to put in place comprehensive national care systems. Now, in doing that work, we're very cognizant about thinking of culture change in addition to political change. And so we're keen to look at very much the role of men and how they think about their role in households in the world of work so that we can support a culture change that supports policy change and political change. Now, notwithstanding the centrality of care, I mean, our, our overall approach as UNRIST has come out very many times in this conference with what you've all said in the panels, is that the, the system that sits behind how we govern and incentivize economics in particular is detrimental to gender equality across the board. So when you have key social policy services and institutions that are underfunded, under-resourced, and not universal, so social protection, health, education, I would add even on infrastructure and the transition to the new zero carbon economies that we will need to move to. When those are under-resourced, underfunded, and under-supported, then it's always women that suffer. So it's clearly an agenda that's comprehensive and requires a full, comprehensive, and deep lens to work out what the gendered impacts of this recovery will need to be. And there are, there are clearly projects that can go in tandem with that, and projects that support women's autonomy politically, bodily, for their time. And those can be an important part of it too, but those in isolation are clearly not going to be enough. And I think this is what donors typically concentrate on as a project approach without looking at the broader system that sits behind it. Those are the four quick points I wanted to get away, but I wanted to concentrate on the fifth one. Even before the COVID pandemic, there was a very high number of low and lower middle income countries in particular that were in debt distress or at risk of debt distress. And so while you need political will, leadership, institutions, and a certain energy towards the sorts of systemic reforms that are going to be needed, you can't do it with the absolute crunch on fiscal space that is happening at the domestic level now that's been amplified through COVID and is going to come to an absolute head because of the conflict uh, in Ukraine and the impacts particularly for, food, for uh, commodity importing countries on food, fuel and fertilizers. And so what does that mean for, in, in answer to the question of, you know, for the panel? How do you support a, a feminist lens driven building back differently slash better from COVID it's clearly not just about national policies and politics. It's also clearly about the international context and space that allows those changes and investments to be made. And I think as a community, the, the campaigns, the public mo mobilization, the policy awareness of the fiscal crunch that is likely to come for the majority of the world's low and middle income countries over the next two years has to start now. Because when the World Bank and the regional development banks and the IMF go to uh, renegotiate new lending packages or consider, not whether, consider whether defaults are possible or not, the space that's given them to buy the contributing shareholders of the banks, how will the IMF have its conversations with governments on which elements of spending will be cut to balance the books when this fiscal crunch happens. All of those are going to be gender equality negative. And so the public campaign and public awareness on this, in, in what will happen now over the next two to three years, has to start now. 
and I think it can be resourced very strongly by this community of thinkers, some of whom cross into campaigning and the practitioner sphere as well, but clearly with a strong academic um, base. So that was the, the point I wanted to add. I think you know the vision is there for national changes and for dreaming about how those can be imagined, but the international phase that we're moving into is going to be incredibly restrictive. And unless we tackle that at the same time, then none of the national policy change is actually going to be possible. Thank you very much, Paul. I would like to invite our um, third um, panelist, and this is Corina Rodriguez Enriquez. She is a researcher at the National Council of Research and Interdisciplinary Center for the Study of Public Policies in Buenos Aires, Argentina. She is a member of the Executive Committee at Development Alternatives with Women for a New Era, DAWN. And she is co-director of the PhD program on political economy in the Universidad Nacional de San Martin. Corina, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, Avena. I will make my presentation in Spanish, so I know by now many of you understand Spanish, but those of you that still not, you will need to use your, your app, so just letting you know. Um, bueno, voy a, a, a hacer tres comentarios básicos, eh, tomando un poco, siendo más obediente, tomando un poco la consigna de Avena. Eh, reflexionando un poco en qué significa una recuperación económica feminista, cuáles son los desafíos para, para su implementación y cuáles son algunas estrategias posibles bastante alineado con cosas que ya se, se dijeron. Eh, comenzando por, por algo que, que se dijo bien desde el inicio en esta mesa, que la recuperación, recuperarse, eh, no es la idea de volver al mismo lugar desde el que nos caímos, eh, sino que más bien se trata de transformar el camino. Eh, y recordarnos que, que la crisis del COVID se montó sobre crisis preexistentes. Eh, crisis ambiental, crisis energética, crisis de los cuidados. Y agudizó todas estas y, y, e hizo resurgir otras latentes como la crisis alimentaria. Eh, por lo tanto, una recuperación económica feminista me parece que en lo que tiene que operar, como también ya, ya se dijo, eh, es en los problemas sistémicos. Eh, ¿Cuáles son los problemas sistémicos centrales desde una perspectiva feminista? En primer lugar, la desigualdad. Eh, no solamente la desigualdad de género en sus múltiples interseccionalidades, sino también la desigualdad socioeconómica expresada en la obscena concentración de riqueza eh, conviviendo con una extensa proliferación de pobreza eh, y la desigualdad no solamente dentro de los países sino también entre los países. El, el segundo problema sistémico que me parece que esta recuperación feminista tiene que, que abordar, que transformar, es la lógica extractiva del sistema económico, que refiere no solamente a la lógica extractiva de los recursos naturales y de los medios de vida, y somos conscientes de la urgencia que impone la crisis climática, sino también una lógica que es extractiva de los trabajos, de los tiempos, de los cuerpos, que también involucra una dimensión de extractivismo financiero, crecientemente. Creo que el tercer problema sistémico que, que esta recuperación debe abordar y transformar es la captura corporativa. La captura corporativa de la propia agenda de desarrollo, la captura corporativa de los espacios de toma de decisión de política pública, no solamente a nivel de los estados nacionales, sino también la captura corporativa de la gobernanza económica global. Y diría que el cuarto problema sistémico que esta transformación o esta recuperación feminista tiene que abordar 
es la extrema mercantilización y financiarización de los procesos de vida. Ejemplo de lo cual puede ser que el agua y los alimentos hoy funcionen como activos financieros. Es solo un ejemplo de la extrema mercantilización y financiarización de todos los aspectos de, de la vida. Creo que estos son los cuatro problemas sistémicos más esenciales que una recuperación feminista debería abordar eh, y, que tiene, y que enfrenta desafíos para, para su implementación. Eh, creo que un gran desafío, eh, y aquí algo ya se señalaba, es la fuerza de la restauración del paradigma de la austeridad, eh, en algunos casos promovido desde los, el propio problema del endeudamiento, el estrés de, de endeudamiento, de deuda soberana, de deuda pública, pero también privada, o contenedores privados, eh, que apareció mucho en las conversaciones en esta conferencia. Eh, pero también el, la restauración del paradigma de la austeridad, incluso en contextos que no están sufriendo este estrés del endeudamiento, porque el paradigma de la, de la austeridad está muy arraigado como, como narrativa dominante. Eh, creo que el segundo desafío es la dinámica del poder, la economía política, y traigo aquí algunos ejemplos. Eh, uno de, del país donde yo vivo, Argentina, eh, como parte de hacer frente a la crisis del COVID, el gobierno argentino quiso imponer para financiar el paquete de medidas que impulsó para sostener eh, los ingresos de la población y la actividad económica en medio de la pandemia, quiso imponer un impuesto a las grandes fortunas. En Argentina no tenemos un impuesto a la riqueza, tenemos una cosa muy marginal, y el gobierno quiso imponer un impuesto a las grandes fortunas. Y la batalla política que se dio para que así fuera, incluso en medio de esa emergencia que fue la, la pandemia del COVID, fue enorme, y lo que se terminó implementando fue una especie de aporte por única vez, incluso eh, establecido con una narrativa de la caridad de los ricos, ¿no? ayudando a los demás a sobrepasar este, este momento. Y el otro ejemplo que quería traer sobre la dinámica de poder a la que nos enfrentamos para poder impulsar una recuperación feminista es lo que sucedió muy recientemente en la conferencia ministerial de la OMC con la propuesta de el waiver, del TRIPS waiver, el, el, el waiver de, del Tratado sobre Propiedad Intelectual, donde había una propuesta de un grupo de países eh, en que se estableciera este TRIPS waiver, que fue totalmente diluida y donde lo que se terminó aprobando fue una cosa muy acotada, limitada estrictamente a un waiver eh, en, en, en vacunas, sin incluir diagnósticos, tratamientos, eh, equipamiento médico, eh, la, la dilución de esa, de esa iniciativa me parece que es un buen ejemplo de la dinámica de poder a la que nos enfrentamos muy asociada a la desigualdad, que es el, el, problema, el primer problema sistémico que, que mencionaba. Creo que, que un tercer desafío, eh, y está claro que estamos en una conferencia de economistas, porque digo el primero, el segundo, el tercero, eh, creo que el tercer desafío de, eh, que enfrentamos para poder impulsar esta agenda es el, 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 el washing multicolor, ¿no? el pink washing, el green washing, el blue washing, del cual también hablamos en, en varias sesiones en esta conferencia. Eh, el peligro de que creamos que se están haciendo cosas a favor de abordar los problemas de la desigualdad y algunos de los problemas sistémicos, y que sea solo un, un maquillaje, ¿no? una pintura superficial. Creo que en esto tenemos que estar muy alerta. Y finalmente, eh, el último desafío que quería mencionar refiere al debilitamiento de la democracia en muchos de nuestros países, e incluso al retroceso en conquistas a favor de los derechos y la autonomía de las mujeres, de la cual, eh, y, y el crecimiento de una re narrativa reaccionaria, ¿no? de la cual el, el fallo de la Corte Suprema de los Estados Unidos en relación con el aborto es solo un ejemplo.
Para cerrar, ¿cuáles me parece que son las estrategias posibles para enfrentar esos, estos desafíos y mover esta eh, recuperación feminista? Creo que todavía necesitamos eh, fortalecer nuestra, una narrativa alternativa y, y, y en este sentido creo que es importante cómo nombramos las cosas. Creo que tenemos que pasar de hablar de gender sensitive a hablar de gender transformative. Eh, creo que es importante que esta narrativa alternativa refuerce la idea de que políticas que solo se enfoquen en las manifestaciones de la desigualdad de género van a ser insuficientes, no solamente porque hace falta un abordaje interseccional, sino porque lo que hay que mover son políticas que operan sobre las raíces de la reproducción de la desigualdad. Creo que una estrategia clave, y de esto las feministas eh, tenemos mucha práctica, eh, es ponerle el cuerpo. Eh, esta idea de pasar de la retórica a la acción necesita que le pongamos las feministas el cuerpo, eh, que pongamos el cuerpo en, en, en esos espacios, que, que hagamos parte de esos actores que pueden ejercer esta, esta transformación. Para traer algo que se hablaba en el plenario de inicio, Rebecca Greenspan decía, eh, politics is important. Eh, hay que ponerle el, el cuerpo ¿no? a, a la política. Eh, y en ese sentido creo que quienes todavía hay, también hemos tenido un debate en esta conferencia respecto de si el Estado es un actor de la transformación, en tal caso tal vez la pregunta es cómo hacemos que el Estado sea un actor de la transformación, eh, y creo que para eso lo que necesitamos es habitarlo de feministas. Eh, no sé si, eh, esto con la traducción no va a hacer ningún sentido, ¿no? pero feministar el Estado sería algo así, eh, y, y quiero traer aquí también algunos ejemplos. De nuevo, el caso de Argentina, eh, que en Argentina venimos de, una, de un proceso de años recientes de mucha expansión del activismo feminista y un cambio de gobierno justo antes del inicio de la pandemia que implicó la incorporación de feministas en el gobierno nacional, en áreas de, de toma de decisión, y eso permitió que incluso en el contexto de la pandemia en Argentina se pudieran mover algunos proyectos de política pública claves a, los, a la agenda feminista. Se presentó un proyecto para modificar el esquema de licencias de cuidado, se eh, presentó un proyecto para crear un sistema de cuidados y se implementó un programa de formalización del trabajo eh, de casas particulares, del trabajo <coughs> doméstico remunerado. Incluso en medio de un contexto restrictivo, habiendo feministas en, en el gobierno, se pudieron impulsar estas acciones. El otro ejemplo que quiero traer es el de Chile, que también está viviendo un proceso de mucha movilización social y política desde antes de la pandemia, con mucho activismo feminista, que llevó a que en Chile se pudiera convocar una asamblea constituyente para discutir una nueva constitución. En Chile todavía rige la constitución de la época de la dictadura de Pinochet, y actualmente acaba de terminar de sesionar la Asamblea Constituyente en la que participaron, se eligieron quienes iban a participar en esa asamblea, muchas feministas fueron elegidas y el proyecto de nueva constitución incluye la determinación constitucional del derecho al cuidado. Creo que sin feministas habitando esa Asamblea Constituyente esto no se hubiera podido, podido hacer. Y para, para ir cerrando, eh, creo que la otra gran estrategia que, que tenemos que implementar para superar los desafíos y mover esta recuperación feminista tiene que ver con articular las resistencias y las acciones. Recién tuvimos en esta misma sala una, un, una mesa sobre cómo movernos de, de la academia a la acción. Eh, creo que este tipo de articulaciones son imprescindibles. Eh, quiero traer de nuevo la invocación que hacía Lynn en el, en el panel de apertura sobre la relevancia del internacionalismo feminista. También hemos tenido estos debates, ¿no? las cosas que operan a nivel local, pero los cambios sistémicos requieren de, eh, de acción global e internacional. Creo que es muy importante que seamos vocales en los espacios de gobernanza eh, global, como decía Guita en escena en una sesión ayer, decirle la verdad al poder, 
y que, la poder, y, y que el poder lo escuche. Y creo que es importante que como, como feministas articulemos con, con otros movimientos existentes, con los movimientos por la justicia fiscal, con los movimientos por la justicia climática, eh, con las acciones que, que se impulsan con subas y bajas en contra de los flujos financieros ilícitos, etc. Creo que hay un, un, una serie bastante larga de iniciativas que están empujándose desde hace tiempo y, y en las que como feministas y como académicas deberíamos eh, involucrarnos. En breve, eh, creo que como dice Crystal, tenemos que seguir imaginando y sobre todo tenemos que seguir haciendo mucho feminismo. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Corina. I am going to make a request. I hope I'm not putting you on the spot. But in the chat, I realized that um, those participating um, through YouTube um, did not have the translation. Could you give us a very short, quick summary of what you said? <laughs> Would I be putting you on the spot? In English? Y yes, please. <laughs> Okay, I, I refer to three main issues. One, uh, what it means, uh, a feminist economic recovery. And there I highlighted four systemic uh, problems that, that we should handle. Inequality, the extractivist logic of the economic system, the corporate capture, and the mar marketization and financialization of of many dimensions of, of life. Uh, the second issue was what are the challenges for implementing this feminist uh, recovery? Uh, and I talk about the, the paradigm, the, the uh, restoration of the paradigm of, of austerity. Uh, I talk about how we need to face power dynamics and I, give, I gave some examples uh, the, the more global one is what happened recently at the ministerial conference of um, the uh, OMC, uh, the WTO, uh, on the TRIPS waiver, where there was a, uh, a proposal from some governments in the south that was very diluted by governments in the north. Uh, I, I talk about the, the problem of the multicolor washing that we are facing. And finally, I mentioned uh, the, the obstacles of the weak democracies in, in many of, of our countries and, and the, uh, the, the increasing uh, reactionary narrative against uh, women's rights. And finally, I mentioned uh, some possible strategies and I talk about strengthening uh, this alternative narrative and I propose shifting from gender sensitive to gender transformative. Uh, I talk about, and I really don't know how to translate, to put the body <laughs> into, into, the, into, the, into the fight, uh, talking about the need that we have to populate uh, spaces where decisions are made by feminists. And I gave some examples about how when feminists are in the governments, some Gender, transform, uh, gender transformative policies can, can go through. And finally, I talk about the need to articulate resistances and, and activism, uh, being vocal in, in spaces of, of global governance and articulating our work as academics uh, or as feminist academics uh, with many initiatives for fiscal justice, climate justice, social justice that already, already exist. I hope that helps. So Thank you very, very much. <laughs> that way, our YouTube participants have an idea of what you said. Thank you. So, I will now like to invite our fourth um, panelist, and this is James Hines. James Hines is the Andrew Glynn Professor of Economics and Chair, Department of Economics, University of Massachusetts, Amherst. James has written on a wide range of policy issues, including the intersection between economics and human rights. His policy work has included work in developing countries, primarily in sub-Saharan Africa. And James is the current chair of the Development Committee of IAPE. 
So James, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Abina. Um, I actually have some slides, so if the technical people could pull up the, the slides. Um, I'm actually going to talk about um, one of the themes of this conference, which is human rights. Um, so I'm going to bring us back to, to a discussion of, of, of human rights. And I'm also going to talk about a word that I've heard over and over and over again in this conference without people actually uh, saying much what they mean by that word, and that word is justice. So I want to talk about justice this morning um, and uh, approach these issues from more philosophy, not just, just, just economics. Um, and so I want to begin with, with some um, observations about the COVID pandemic and the ethical issues that, that, that uh, it raised. It kicked up a lot of longstanding ethical issues that became uh, very um, obvious and, and, but very difficult to deal with. Um, one is just uh, issues around values. How do we value human lives? When we shut down an economy uh, and, and, and have a retraction of income in order to save lives, we're, we're, we're valuing lives versus kind of economic activity and those trade-offs. How, how do we think about that? Lots of questions around distribution and very fundamental uh, distributive questions. Who actually gets to live? Uh, who, who got the vaccines first in terms of the global north and, and, and the global south? Lots of intersectional inequalities, uh, gender inequalities, uh, inequalities on the basis of, of race, ethnicity, uh, where relevant uh, class. And importantly, to recognize intergenerational in inequalities. Er early on in the pandemic, the failure of, uh, to protect those in long-term care facilities facilities was one of the big moral failings of, of many of our societies. And there's questions around duties, ethical questions around duties. Suddenly we had an enormous increase in demand for care, uh, but whose duty is it to provide that care? Uh, and at, at what risk to those people? You know, when women are on the front lines of, 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 of caregiving uh, during a pandemic, they're putting themselves at, 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 at risk. Um, the question of justice, you know, I think is, is very uh, important when we're talking about uh, a feminist vision from wh of where we go from here. Because I think the imperative for an alternative that we all agree on is that uh, it, it's based on, on the need for uh, social and economic justice, advancing that in a currently very unjust um, a, a world. But what I want to challenge you uh, this morning to think about, since uh, I haven't heard a lot of discussion about the details of this, is what concept of justice are, are we actually talking about? I think we don't raise this question because we have an assumption that we're all on the same page, that we all basically agree on the same principles of justice. And I'm not sure that's correct. And so I want to uh, illustrate uh, that uh, with a little story. Um, and I'm borrowing this from Amartya Sen, uh, or adapting it from Amartya Sen. Um, so um, this, um, I'm calling it the parable of, of the, the flute. And it's just a thought exercise to get you thinking about these, these issues. So here's the setup. It's a really simple setup. We had three children. I'm calling them Summer, Dakota, and Jamie. And there's one flute. And we have to decide which of these three children get, get the flute. And each of the children make an ethical claim of why they should get get the flute. So here's Summer's ethical claim. Summer says that they should get the flute uh, because they are the ones that made the, made the flute through their own labor. And so things should belong to those, those who make them. So that's Summer's ethical claim. Dakota makes a different ethical claim. Um, Dakota says that they're the only ones that can actually play the flute. And so they can um, actually create music, and all three can actually enjoy the benefits of, 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 of that. So, so, so Dakota should be the one uh, that gets the, the flute. Jamie's ethical claim is, is different. Um, uh, Jamie didn't make the flute. Jamie can't uh, play the flute. But Jamie says that Summer and Dakota have a lot of other possessions. You know, they're, they're, they're very well off. Jamie has nothing else. And so the flute means a lot more uh, to Jamie. Uh, than, than the other, other two. So Jamie should get the flute, okay? So I would say, if I went around this room and asked each of you who should get the flute, <laughs> we would have a, a really rich discussion, a lot of disagreement, a lot of different perspectives. So the assumption uh, that uh, we all agree on what we mean by justice, I want, I want to question that um, right now. Uh, and, and 
these three, I mean, it's, it, it, it's a kind of a, a simple setup, but each of the ethical claims these children are making is a major con a concept of, of justice. The first one, you know, things should belong to those who make them. A, a lot of Marxist thinking is, is inspired by this. You know that one of the principal injustices in a lot of Marxian analysis is that the workers produce goods and services, and then the capitalist, who's not actually producing it with their uh, own labor, appropriates some of that. that. That's a moment of injustice there. I would say the, the argument that um, things belong to people who make them is also consistent with Robert Nozick, you know, the conservative moral philosopher and a defender of individual property rights. So even within one of these principles of justice, you have a, a many different interpretations. Uh, feminist economists, you know, the idea that things should belong to uh, those who make them, uh, I think feminist economists complicate this even further when we think of human beings as being produced through caring labor. Uh, so uh, if, if, if we say things should belong to, to those who produce them, it raises very murky ethical uh, uh, questions. Um, Dakota's um, argument is, is a form of utilitarianism, right? The greatest good for the greatest uh, number through the provision, in this case, of a public good, through, through, through the provision of music. And Jamie's ethical claim uh, is, is a variation of Rawls. You know, Rawls' uh, different prin difference principles. Though those who have the least should, should have, have, have priority. Um, and so what I want to, I, the point I'm making here is that questions of justice and what we mean by justice are really hard questions and require a lot of, of analysis. And I would say that they're equally as hard as figuring out the policy um, so that we're actually going to follow post-COVID. Post, post -COVID. But without a clear idea of what we mean by justice, how are we going to develop those policies to actually achieve, <laughs> achieve, achieve that justice? That's, that's one issue I, I want to raise. I would also say that how we conceptualize of justice and how the path towards justice uh, has a lot of implications for strategies. So one very uh, uh, classic approach to thinking about advancing justice um, is to see economic injustices as tied up into the form of the economic system we have. And by the economic system, I mean the collection of institutions that make up that system and the distribution of assets and uh, economic resources. And so capitalism, a certain set of institutions, market institutions and so on, and a certain distribution of, of, of the economic resources, who owns the means of production um, and so on, defines that, that, that system. And so if we think uh, capitalism is unjust, kind of one approach is you have to come up with a different set of institutions, you have to come up with a different set of, of, um, of distrib a different distribution of assets. And that's going to define a different econ economic system. So let's call it socialism. <laughs> so you have, have capitalism. In order to achieve uh, uh, economic justice, you have to transform the entire system uh, into an, an alternative system. And then you will have a more just society. So that's one way of, of thinking about it. Um, I, 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 th I have issues with this um, is, is the way of, of conceptualizing uh, uh, how you achieve uh, uh, justice. One is, you know, let's all just admit it that overthrowing global capitalism is actually really hard to do. And so you're kind of setting yourself up for almost an impossible task. And, and the other uh, issue is that this kind of erase uh, incremental uh, advances in, 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 in justice. So if you achieve universal health care within a capitalist system, it's often devalued by this because you haven't actually changed capitalism, right? Uh, and so you, you devalue um, incremental uh, a, a advances um, uh, in, in social justice. This is the reform versus revolution uh, issue that, that, that Crystal uh, uh, mentioned. So can we get around, get out of this, you know, reform versus revolution type of, of way of thinking? So the alternative way that I would propose is to think of economic justice uh, is, be, is be de being defined by outcomes, the actual outcomes that we have a reason uh, to, to value, um, combined with the processes whereby we actually achieve those, those, those outcomes. So uh, it's not enough just to sp focus on realized outcomes, but how you get there is also very important. So let me give you a very trivial example that I think actually has profound um, implications. So imagine two people, we'll call them person A, uh, in person B, and they're both deciding whether to stay at home at night, this is where it gets trivial, or go out and meet friends. Um, the, the, both of them are trying to des decide that. So person A just bought a book that they're dying to read, um, and so they decide, I just want a quiet night at home, I just want to really enjoy that, that book I just bought, so I'm deciding to stay at home. Uh, person B 
um, also trying to decide whether to stay at home or go out with friends, um, is actually in an abusive relationship. And their partner gets really jealous when they uh, leave the household and, and, and meet friends. Um, and that person could be subject uh, to, to domestic violence, you know, if they had decided to, to go out. So person B decides to stay at home. If we evaluate those two situations in terms of realized outcomes, they're identical. You know, both people stay at home. But we would not treat those two situations as ethically or morally um, equivalent. Um, and so processes matter. How we, how we get there um, really matters. In, uh, institutions and the distribution of economic resources are still important in this other approach, but they're instrumental. You know, it's the, the institutions that achieve justice are the ones that get us those realized outcomes through uh, processes uh, that are consistent uh, with, with, with justice. So here's where my plug for our human rights comes in, because I think human rights actually, if we, we, we consider the whole framework uh, 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 in its entirety, uh, gives us a, a a very important uh, framework for justice uh, for thinking about where we go from here. Uh, the human rights framework is uh, 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 based on realized outcomes, so it's that, that second uh, approach. Uh, and the outcomes that we uh, value the most, those are the ones are, that are raised to the status of rights. Uh, the right to life, the right to health, the right to education, the right to an adequate, adequate standard of living, the right to work and make meaningful contributions to society. Those are the realized outcomes uh, that we're talking about. Processes, though, in the human rights uh, framework are also critical. So these are the uh, civil and political rights. You know, democratic, democratic voices, participation uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the formation of our economic institutions and, and so on. Freedom from uh, coercion or, 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 or oppression. Um, so processes and outcomes are, are part of the human rights framework. Institutions, again, become instrumental to this. Uh, so in the human rights framework, the state has a, has a very strong role to play. It's considered the, the primary duty bearer. So the, the state is the one that's responsible for making sure the conditions are right for the realization of, of rights through these, these, these processes. Um, and so it doesn't mean that the state has to provide all these outcomes directly, but it has to ensure that the right set of institutions are in place that are consistent with the realization of, of, of rights. And distribution is important. There, there's fundamental principles of equality and non-discrimination with respect to the realized outcomes in the processes. You know, that, that's the real focus on, on, the, on the distribution, not necessarily the distribution of income. Again, that becomes instrumental for realizing um, uh, uh, the, these, these outcomes. So I think if you take this all together, it really provides us a, a, a framework for thinking about how, how we proceed um, in, in, in terms of this, this I, I don't want to use the word post-COVID because a number of people here already got COVID, so we're still deal, dealing with COVID. Um, so, but kind of where we go from, from here. Now, uh, in the opening plenary, uh, Lynn uh, Asame uh, really pr uh, problematized the, the, the human rights framework. And I, I think that's because of this historical break in, in human rights. So human rights are divided into these two groups. You have the economic and social rights on one side. Well, it's not on one side, but they are, are dealt with together. And then you have civil political rights that are, are, are dealt uh, with together. So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, um, uh, was where this framework first was kind of presented uh, as, as an international framework, um, ethical framework. And immediately after, uh, we had the Cold War, and it split the rights in, into, into these two divisions. So you had some countries that were really focused on economic and social rights, uh, the socialist centrally planned economies. You know, the iron rice bowl of China is really about guaranteeing a, a, a core set of economic uh, and social rights. And then you had kind of the Western countries, um, the US uh, uh, proclaiming itself the defender of freedom in, in, in this context. But it, the freedom is only articulated in terms of civil and political rights and not really recognizing that people's material conditions are, 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 are fundamental for <laughs> determining the freedoms uh, uh, that they, they, they have. And you know, Lynn, Lynn's um, uh, criticism of the human rights framework I think is derivative of this, that you have a lot of human rights um, uh, agencies, uh, uh, human rights uh, organizations that really focus on the civil and political rights um, and then kind of impose them on, 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 uh, on other, other countries. Uh, but this division, the, this fracturing of, of rights, 
is itself a violation of human rights. Uh, that's what we really have to uh, understand. If, if you can, if you only focus on civil and political rights and not economic and, and social rights, uh, th th they're not rights anymore. You know, you and you can't, you know, give some rights to to to, to people and not to to other people because then it's not a right. Um, and so the, a, a fundamental principle of human rights are that human rights are inalienable. You can't take them away from people, um, they're, they're, they're rights. And they're um, indivisible, they're inseparable. So you can't just pick and choose among um, a menu of rights. You have to take the, 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 the whole package. And what I, I'll challenge you to think is that if you take the full package of these rights and you do consider them as indivisible, um, it's, and you think of what it will take to achieve them on a global scale, it's actually a very radical vision uh, looking forward. Um, Radhika Balankrishnan and Diane Elson sitting together, uh, we, we wrote a book together where the, um, where the subtitle was the radical potential of, of, of human rights. And this is the case uh, uh, that, that we're trying to make. The last point I'll make is that the human rights framework is not static, it's, it's evolving. And I'm not saying that it's perfect and that there, there's areas where it needs to, to improve. So I, I've, I've identified four areas where I think uh, we really need to do some more thinking. One is globalization. Um, the human rights framework is one of the few global ethical frameworks, you know, ideas of social contracts, things like that are very based on in a particular society and not, not really a, a, a global ethical uh, a framework. But, you know, um, again, the state is the prime duty bearer within the human rights framework, which does locate it within a particular nation state. So um, the, the idea of uh, extraterritorial obligations, uh, the, the fact that actions by one country can uh, undermine rights somewhere where else, uh, we really have to explore that a, a lot better. There is a document, the Maastricht uh, Principles, that really uh, uh, look into this issue, but it has not been uh, uh, adopted by a convention or um, a covenant, it's not, it's not really a, at the status of an international a, agreement. Um, future generations, what status do the rights of people who don't exist yet actually um, uh, have, you know, in terms of our, our, our deliberation? Uh, a major question when we're thinking about sustainability in, in, in climate change. So the, the human rights framework needs to think about that. I mean, one answer is that uh, actions today shouldn't undermine the rights of future generations. They should be sustainable um, in, in that way, but it requires more and more elaboration. Income and wealth inequality. So inequality within the human rights framework are about the realized outcomes. So those are the outcomes with respect to education, health, adequate standard of living, um, and, and so on. But we're living in an increasingly polarized world. And, and, and those increasing inequalities have the potential to undermine the, the realization of, of, of rights. So how do we actually take into account that? And how do we think of the distribution of income and wealth, even though it's just instrumental to achieve achieving those, the, 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 the set of rights that we actually um, value. And unpaid uh, labor and, uh, and valuing care. I'm just thinking about this, there's not a right to care in the Universal Declaration or in any of the conventions and so on, but I think we, a case could be made <laughs> coming out of this, this pandemic. But if we're establishing a right to care, uh, who has the duty to provide that, 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 that care? Um, and you know, the way it's been provided actually undermines some of these other rights in terms of uh, uh, equality and non-discrimination. So those are uh, food for thought, uh, looking forward, and I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, James. So I would now like to um, open the floor for comments and questions um, from the audience. I think we need someone to yeah. facilitate. Yes. Can you see the people? Abena, can you see people? No, I can't. Okay. I, so can't. I, got I, I do it. Is this working? I got the, I got the microphone first, so I'm going to go first. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Gudrunala Anktat. I have a question for uh, James. Um, I uh, hear, and it's quite relevant, but I, when I was listening to you, I couldn't help but think, particularly within the context of COVID, which nations responded best, and they're not the ones that have the human rights agenda on the priority list. It's the East Asian countries. So I wondered what your comment is on that. Thank you. Okay. Um, is this on? It's on. 
thank you very much. This was a very scintillating and w a wonderful way to end this conference. Uh, I wanted to, uh, again, address my uh, uh, question to James. And that is, I think you, you, you know, I think challenging us to think about how we all, and all of those claims had value. You know, they were logical, they were normatively justifiable. But when you talked about the human rights uh, framework, you mentioned duty twice, right? The state has a duty and who has a duty to care. And while I agree absolutely, you know, Anne Phillips has written a book, Unconditional Equality, and I think rights are unconditional. But is there any room in here for duties, which are not just the duties of the state, but the duties we have towards each other and towards the planet? So I wonder if there's more room in there. And the trouble is the word duty has been given a very dirty meaning by people who say, it's your, you know, you don't get any rights without performing your taxation and your work and work to welfare. But is there not a way to give duty a meaning which acknowledges our interdependence and our collective, uh, you know, our collective values. Do you want to take this back? Um. Uh, hi, good morning. My name is Minakshi. I'm from IDS in the UK, and my question is also for James. I think uh, you, you have provoked a lot of thoughts, so thank you for refreshing and for bringing a moral philosophy and normative perspective into the economics conference. Um, my question was that in your three-child problem, a fourth option that you didn't share could have been that the flute remains there, and anyone who would like to use it, play it, admire it can do. So I'm referring to the commons. Um, and somewhere implicit in all of this rights and redistribution, even though you've recast it, is an assumption of inalienable property rights, which I think uh, also is something which we don't challenge and question, because if human generations for the future, and many cultures across the world, do have the concept of commons. I come from India, and you know we have a lot of stories from there, I know from many other cultures. So I'd really like to hear how economists would consider uh, placing the commons at the heart of some of these redistributive problems. Thank you. Julia uh, Wodarczyk, thank you. Uh, there is yet another issue associated with uh, the context of, of talking about justice, associated with knowledge and information imperfections. Uh, so information asymmetry can play an important role uh, in this case. Transparency, for example, does Jamie know uh, that Summer and Dakota have more? How, how does he know? What about commitment? Uh, do Summer and Jamie believe Dakota that uh, she can play the flute? What about motivation? Does Jamie has any motivation to, to change his situation other than via transfers? What is the morality of rent seeking in these cases? Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so uh, information about rights is also crucial here. For, for the whole world. And just one last uh, uh, remark, bitter one, because uh, when you mentioned uh, the rights of future generations, I'm afraid that uh, you know the changes in the abortion law actually may put this, uh, may take, may emphasize it, that this is you know, respecting the rights of future generations. This is something I'm afraid of. <laughs> Thank you. I think um, James can respond to this, or the panel can respond to this first set of questions, and then we go for another round. Thank you. So, um, Gould's question, uh, the, 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 those that responded best to the COVID pandemic also don't do well on other dimensions of, of rights. I mean, you could come up with many ex examples of something similar. Uh, but my point is that the, then they're not like fully embracing a human rights framework. So that's the challenge uh, going forward because it's, it's a question of indivisibility. You can't pick and, 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 and choose. So that, that, that's what I think is, makes it, what makes the ethical questions sometimes harder than you know some of the policy questions. Because uh, you could, yeah, you could have a very, uh, you could have a solution to COVID that uh, takes away all rights. You have, you know, uh, undemocratic state, you know, that that implements these these policies. But is that our vision for the future? That that that's the question. So how could we take those responses and and, and make them better going going go, going forward? Um, 
duties and, 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 and rights. Uh, in the human rights pr framework, the duties are, are called obligations, usually. Uh, there's three main obligations of the state. The obligation um, to respect rights, so the state doesn't violate rights directly. The obligation to fulfill rights, that's picking the right set of institutions um, to, that are consistent with the realization of rights. And the obligation um, to, to uh, protect rights, that's preventing third parties from taking actions that um, actually uh, under, undermine rights. So those are, those are the main duties. Why people talk about duties and obligations is just the idea that if you don't have duties and obligations, if no one is responsible for protecting rights, fulfilling rights, or, um, or uh, 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 respecting rights, um, if there's no institution doing that, then they're not rights at all. I mean, it's meaningless. You say you have the right, but there's no way you can, you can actually <laughs> claim those, those rights. But I think, you know, this idea of what are, um, what are the collective dimensions of these rights? You know, how do we enforce the rights outside of just the, you know, the, 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 the state and so on? Um, what's the role of, of, of the commons, you know, as well? Collective dimensions of, of claiming rights um, and realizing, protecting, uh, and, and fulfilling rights. I think that's a whole nother area. I could add it to the fifth <laughs> area, you know, you know that, that we talked um, about. Um, all the comments on, you know, um, Summer, Dakota, and Jamie, that was just to get you to think. I didn't know, I actually, I, I, I'm not sure if it was clear, but I kind of rejected all three of those ethical claims in favor of the human rights framework. And, you know, the ethical foundation um, argument undermining the, not undermining, but underpinning the um, human rights framework is very similar to the capabilities approach. That's really what, uh, and what kind of the ethical thinking is. You know, the substantive freedoms that people have um, in their lives uh, to do uh, things with their lives um, and, and to achieve things and become things that they have reason to value in the, in the course of their lives. That's really the, what's uh, uh, under, underpinning um, the, 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 the human rights framework. So yeah, the, fr the framing of, you know, Summer, Jamie, and so on was about private property and yeah, you. You know the Marxian solution. You know, um, in terms of, of of Summers, I guess argument would be collectivizing property rights. You know, and not having individual uh, 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 property rights in in the role of, of of the commons. Yes, we we can acknowledge that. In fact, you know, there was a Radhika and I were, were talking about uh, having a whole project on the role of the commons uh, in in terms of of, of, of realizing uh, rights and reproductive rights um, are. Uh, are, are essential. So, but I take your point about how any of these rights arguments can be twisted in a way that, uh, but they, they shouldn't be twisted in a way that undermine other rights. So, yeah, that because the right should be inalienable. So, if, if, if you're if you're thinking about future generations and um, that we, c women need to give up their rights now <laughs> in order to, to meet those good, that that itself is a violation of of, of, of the the human rights uh, uh, framework. But it gets tricky. That's why I'm saying that these questions of ethics and justice can be as hard or harder than, you know, just figuring out what policies we, we need to do. But I think it's worth having this discussion here because we throw around the term justice all the time and it's, it, it's hard. Thank you, James. We may have another round of comments and questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to thank first uh, Corina and Crystal for bringing a feminist vision from the Global South into this panel. I'd say actually feminists from the Global South and, and really social movements of the Global South are able to imagine a world without the capitalistic system and they are proposing pathways to, to do that. It's not a joke. Uh, they are doing that right now. And there is a very powerful degrowth movement in the global north for degrowthing the rich that is also very powerful from the economic, uh, ecological perspective that is having very feasible and urgent measures to, to uh, demolish capitalistic system precisely because there is a very clear notion on justice that is a colonial and that is also historical. Uh, so I think it is really important that we go back to our systemic analysis and I really want to bring uh, the invitation of the mic to Crystal and, and um, Corina 
So to Corina, uh, on your invitation to, to thinking about a, a systemic approach, an internationalist uh, project, uh, I wanted to, to ask you a bit more. I mean, I know you gave us a very clear path with, uh, with very key challenges and, and opportunities. So I want to uh, just to, to give you, um, to, to ask you a bit more about this, this ways in which you foresee this internationalist uh, work. And to Crystal, again, um, I'd say uh, th thank you so much for this, this idea of pushing the boundaries about the reformist towards the revolution, because I think what we are saying here is not that we're taking the streets uh, alone, but how do we engage in formal and informal spaces of power, legitimate and democratic, as well as illegitimate uh, spaces of power, uh, and how will we do that while also bringing these feminist and decolonial views that are so in dire need right now? Thank you. Hello. Um, first of all, thank you to all of the speakers. Um, and I guess I want to invoke a quote by Bell Hooks. Um, so Bell Hooks says, I mean, the late Bell Hooks, of course, um, to be part of the margins is to be part of the whole, but outside of the main body. To what degree is the definition of the human the main body? And to what degree are other persons in the margins defined in the kind of exogeny of that main body? And I want to kind of like return to something that Lynn Osom had said, because I think um, clarity on this is really important. To what degree are we taking something local, maybe a local culture or a local concept of what it is to be human and what it is to have human rights and extrapolating that to the level of the global? And, and, and on that, I guess I want to revisit the question, how much are human rights concepts divine, defined by Western discourse? How prescriptive that can be? And are we assuming that what is produced locally is, is inherently produced locally, or if it is a global mapping? To what degree do we mistake the map for the territory, and to what degree are we not in touch with the, the needs of those invisibilized because they're actually defined in exogeny to what it is to be human. That's all. Hi, uh, Juliette Ries from the Global Initiative for Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and I think this is more going to be a ramble because it's like something touched up in my brain right now that I see as a conundrum. Um, and it's this idea of revolution versus reformation and that basically the alternative approach would be believing in the institutions of human rights when at this point, having worked at the UN and around the UN, human rights institutions have continuously failed us on, on many levels. So how do we manage to implement human rights that I see as a key instrument to do the revolution against the systems that are oppressing on so many levels? And then also maybe linking it back to an earlier panel that we had in this very same room, as already mentioned, this idea that human rights are insanely politicized. And it's, it's based on a political concept in, that is entrenched within the system of oppressions that we're facing. So how do we deal with this and using human rights still as a way to push for economic, injust, uh, for economic injustice, <laughs> exactly, um, if we don't go for a revolution of the system? Uh, this is Bill Gartan, and this is on. Is this on? Ah, okay. Okay, great. Uh, this is Bill Gartan from Northeastern University, and uh, as a proud student of James, of course, my question is for James, too. Uh, but um, uh, so I was wondering, uh, you know, uh, for as taking concrete steps, because as you highlighted, we live in an extremely polarized world. Uh, I mean, under the Trump administration, even the UN, because uh, I worked there for briefly, and they had trouble financed, like funding themselves. Like, just the US government was not even willing to fund these key international organizations. Uh, you know, given this political setting, you know, how can we? Uh, actually mobilize resources to implement the rights that are so crucial as you clearly laid out. And then I see as a second challenge is the AI revolution. It's another type of technological revolution, I guess, if you will. Uh, but, you know, that's also making, I think, very hard to think about, you know, how we can 
um, achieve a just society because you know the, the ownership structure is getting more and more polarized. Um, how do you think about like uh, what Piketty proposes, for example? Um, so in terms of like concrete policy um, solutions, what are some of the things that uh, you would advocate? That's for my question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Rose here. Um, I uh, just wanted to uh, thank Crystal for uh, bringing together so many of the things that I've heard across the conference and uh, for sharing the quote that you shared. I think this is recorded and I will listen back to it, but I would just like to hear it again. I know uh, that we probably don't have time for it, but thank you for, for sharing that. Um, and. Uh, Corina, I, I really like uh, what you said, feminister, and I've been thinking about all the words that come into that. <laughs> um, and, and bringing together so many of the different threats and, and, and problems, uh, but, but bringing it together as across this intersectional approach that, that people have been calling for uh, and for us to come together. Um, and I wanted to also uh, be uh, thankful to the conference uh, organizers for bringing us here together and for being able to, to listen to you all and to connect with you uh, in, in a place that is uh, physical and, and feeling each other's energies. So uh, just very grateful for that. Uh, but uh, yeah, also just uh, wanted to ask again uh, to Christo and Corina to explore a little bit more some of the uh, concepts you've already raised, Corina, on feminister in, in institutions and, and especially in relation to how, uh, for example, um, uh, this, the radical Beijing agenda uh, uh, on women's rights has been institutionalized and in that sense depoliticized and taken away uh, the, the revolution out of that. Um, and, and for Crystal uh, uh, to reflect on, on that uh, concept of revolution versus reform uh, uh, in relation to, to that as well. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. So we will have our panelists um, respond and then we will check the um, chat box to see if our online panel, um, participants have anything to say. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, I'm I'm just going to pick up on a, 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 a few of these points. You know, in terms of changing the, the economic system, what I said isn't inconsistent uh, with kind of having to adopt a completely econo uh, different economic system, you know, uh, if, if, if that's the way to go. The, the, the point is that you don't begin with the, uh, I'm arguing you don't begin with the institutions, just assume that if you, if you uh, uh, change all the institutions, that justice is automatically going to, to flow from that. You, you begin with where you want uh, to, to be in terms of the realized outcomes and the processes with justice, and that could imply a total transformation of all, all, all the in institutions. You just start at a different, different place. Um, and so there are, as I said, there's a lot of uh, real kind of uh, uh, radical potential if you actually think through the whole, whole framework um, as, as, as a whole um, um, in terms of doing that. It also allows for people struggling for inter, incre incremental change to find a, a home with those uh, <laughs> a, a struggling for more uh, uh, system, systematic uh, uh, change. It kind of links them as opposed to setting them uh, against um, each other. Um, that's uh, the, the thing I wanted to, to throw out there. Um, and all of this required, I mean, it's, it, I, I realize that a lot of the human rights um, uh, the institutionalized uh, institutionalization of it has become very apolitical, but it doesn't mean that actually realizing rights, uh, if, if we take it very seriously, is a it, it's a very very political process. It requires a lot of collective action. It requires people to to hold the state to account. It requires them uh, to claim their rights in in, 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 in in many cases and to actually uh, redefine what what those the, the, those mean. Um, the human rights framework, even though it's presented as a global framework, could be totally consistent with a very local, you know, set of, 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 of identities. It, it, basically, it's, it's the things that people value, so a core set of those get elevated to, 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 to the status um, of, of, of rights. So you could have 
uh, many different uh, conceptualizations of, uh, of rights that are very locally uh, uh, based. It, it's, it's consistent with kind of the way you think about it. Um, but also th there's a, a realization of kind of some of these extraterritorial reasons, uh, uh, issues, uh, and the need in, in today's world for a normative framework that is global, that, that, that does kind of recognize some, some key commonalities. And you know, a lot of the rights, um, I think, are, are fairly universal. Things like the right to life, you know, uh, the really fundamental um, uh, uh, rights um, uh, uh, like, uh, like that. Um, let me just leave it, leave it there, yeah. Uh, it, uh, the one other thing I will say, though, is though even though it's a very political process, that there's collective processes, collective action necessarily, I do think that individual rights do remain important within this, especially for those who, who, who are facing exclusion, um, who are maybe uh, being, uh, where you have a, 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 a majority that's uh, marginalizing uh, uh, people. In, in those contexts, in, in individual rights do matter. In, you know, uh, global movements such as Black Lives Matter about you know, protecting the, the individual rights of, of, of people, the right to life in, 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 in that respect, are very pow powerful movements you know, and uh, essential for protecting you know, uh, uh, key uh, pe uh, populations that have um, uh, been, been disadvantaged or, or facing very vulnerable situations. Thanks, um, everyone, for your questions, comments. Um, I guess if you've been to the bathroom downstairs, it's this very minimalist, concrete type um, structure. And I thought I might be a minimalist, but actually I might be a maximalist. I like the detail, I like nuance, I like things and patterns and textures. And so as James was speaking, I was wondering, yes, you know, the right to life, but also I'm wondering what kind of life and who determines that and who determines what quality of life is, what joy means, what happiness means, all those little things and little details um, that make up for all the difference for African women, women in La wherever, wherever we may be. And so I guess I'm kind of stuck in the, in the detailed texture of that. Um, I think it was Jayati who said that change will come from a groundswell, right? Like, it has to be a movement of people. It has to be an uprising of people. And that really humbles me because I know change is not really gonna come from these small spaces of power, of technical experts. Um, um, Sankara called them technical assassins in the, in the African context. And so what we do at Naui and what I'm so interested and passionate in doing is bridging those those gaps between what Lynn calls, you know, from concrete to abstraction or theorization and back to concrete, and how do we constantly make sure that we're landing back on our feet in that? Um, and I guess the question that I'm still really, really grappling with is this revolutionary versus reformist. And for many years I've worked, before this I worked for Feminit, and I know what the holes of power look like, um, the UN, the World Bank. I know what it's like to be at the World Bank annual meetings and being the only representative from an African country, from an, Afri from an, Af from an African civil society, not country, um, feminist organization. I know what that feels like. And so I know what power looks like even in spaces that are supposedly progressive, like civil society, global spaces. And so Lynn this morning questioned, you know, this power, we really need to look at the power of who's asking the questions, not only what the outcomes are, but who's asking the questions that set the framing for narratives, for discourse, for fights, for battles. Um, and again, if, if we're not all there in all our colors and <laughs> nuances, um, I really wonder whose freedom and what justice we're fighting for if it's all black and white without all the different grays in between. Um, how do we make sure that, you know, all our lives are being fought for in a way that makes sense for us where we are? Um, and so that's that's the struggle and that's the tension that I'm always trying to figure out. I was part of um, a project with Crisis Action looking at illicit financial flows from South Sudan to Kenya and, and, and Uganda. Now, usually when I look at illicit financial flows, it's always flows out of the continent. And I was speaking to Mati, who apparently, I don't know if I could say this on a microphone in Geneva, 
but apparently the reason why there can't be a subway in Geneva is because there's up to six um, um, levels of vaults of, of wealth. So I'm practically sitting on <laughs> the wealth of my continent mostly and the wealth of a lot of our continents. And that's something huge, right? <laughs> And so that's the illicit financial flows I'm always um, working on. But I'm also aware that the framework that sets it up for, illicit, for us to be sitting literally on this wealth means that even in my own continent, the same violence happens. So the money that flows out of South Sudan, fueled by the war, which again, questions around where it came from, this war. Um, how, do you, how do you explain that to people and how do you get it away from calls of technical conversations. And so what we did was we did a research paper, a very long, detailed, you know, good, rigorous academic research paper. We then did some policy briefs to hand to policymakers who ne never read, really. And then we did a documentary um, that took all these and put it in a way that people could understand and see and make see themselves in. And that really caused, like, a lot of people to start questioning and thinking. It caused the governor, one of the states that was implicated to be fired, and I think he's facing charges. Um, it raised a lot of questions in governments um, in both Kenya and, and, and Uganda, but globally as well. And so how do we make sure that we're straddling and joining these struggles, making sure that, I think Lebohang said that we, are able to wear the stilettos and come into those spaces and speak in ways that they understand, but also that I'm able to take them off and put on my tackies and um, inhale a little bit of tear gas sometimes in Kenya um, to push for the things that, you know, us as citizens feel are important to push for, not because a framework has said it, because it has an impact on my life. I question how maternal health can be discussed at the World Bank in DC in a group of suits um, and a woman in, a, in my country has no say in what maternal health means. What practices, be they traditional healing methods or modern medicine, what do they actually want? Um, and it's, I'm interested in making sure that those voices are in the spaces that are influencing and pushing for policies that have a direct impact on the quality of their lives, not just a right to their lives, but what sort of life. Okay, very briefly, um, I, I think almost everything was said uh, on, on the, the politicization of, of the agenda. I think it has to do with the power dynamic and, and, and I think it's very important while we try to populate these spaces where decisions are made that we stay very alert of this uh, ability that power has to cope our, our concepts, our ideas, our, our agenda. And I think it's also very important uh, to go back, no? to go back to, to uh, real life and, and, and to pick from there the sense of, of what we are doing. And, and I think it's also important that, that we are aware of our own position of privilege uh, that we have. Uh, for that allows us to be academics and, and to be in the global spaces and, and so on. Uh, so if, if we are aware of that, we will always need to go back to, uh, to the field and, and pick up again what are the concrete, real, everyday life problems of, of people uh, that we are fighting for. And, and I will finish with this uh, reform revolution uh, thing because uh, Valeria asked me to say something and, and I don't know whether it is in English or in Spanish the original phrase of uh, if I cannot dance your revolution is useless or something like that <laughs> so let's okay so let me remind you that tonight we have a party <laughs> <laughs> at Valeria's place and instructions to get there are in the, in the app uh, Abena, back to you. You will miss the party. Unfortunately, I will. Um, 
we've only got four minutes left for um, this closing plenary, and it's really been an interesting um, plenary. I'd like to thank Paul, James, Crystal, and Corina. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation to um, be panelists on this closing plenary. And thank you for your presentations, which give us a lot of, to go back and think about. Thank you um, very much. I began um, the session, I've introduced the panelists, but I didn't introduce myself, I realized. And so <laughs> I am Abena Odro, I'm the outgoing um, president and the conference um, chair. And so I would also like to take <clears throat> this opportunity to invite you all um, to um, the conference. Don't put it in your diaries. It's going to be uh, in Cape Town, at the University of Cape Town, with the African Center for Excellence in Inequality um, Research. So thank you all very much for the participants who have um, attended, both in, um, in person and online. Thank you very much. And I am now going to hand over to IFEC to give the final comments. And before I leave, I would also take this opportunity to thank the um, IAFI staff, to thank um, Kate, and to thank Milena um, for the support that they have provided. Thank you. Very much. Here we are. Can you hear me? Yes at the end of um, two and a half days of very interesting, stimulating presentations, conversations, and exchange. Um, so this has been wonderful. And please allow me to thank, on behalf of the IAFI community, um, the individuals and organizations who made this conference, uh, whose labor and care, I should say, made this conference uh, a true success. So to start with our um, host organization, Geneva Graduate Institute Gender Center, and uh, I will say the names, and please, um, may I ask you to stand up if you're in the room, Emmanuel Chauvet, uh, Vanessa Vela, and Lisa Prugel. And also, I think we need to acknowledge the tech support. They've been wonderful. Uh, you know, it was their work that made this hybrid format a big success. Thank you so much. Um, and then our, um, the organizations who contributed uh, with the funding, but also uh, with their collaboration, the Hewlett Foundation, Friedrich Eber Stiftung, and the UN Research Institute for Social Development. Thank you for your support. And then last but not least, of course, the IAFI conference team, our conference chair, Radhika Balakrishnan. Um, and our staff, Andrea Collins. Andrea, where are you? Jihee Jolly, and, and two part-time staff members who came to our rescue the last minute, uh, Milana Dane and Katie McNamara, and a volunteer, Gayla, is it Brownstein or? It's Stewart. Stewart, Gayla, <laughs> Elisa's daughter, and Gayla Stewart. And we look forward to seeing you all on the online events, uh, in the upcoming online events, and in Cape Town next year. Ah, Valeria Escuel asked me to remind you that she's expecting anyone who's interested, along with your friends and other guests, at her house. All the details are on Whova on the app. Um, but you can also ask Jihi or me about the details. But uh, if you're planning on going and have not registered yet, please do reply on the Whova app. Goodbye. <laughs>